Good afternoon. It is now 12 o'clock, so it's the afternoon. I know everyone's excited to be here today, and I want to introduce myself. My name is Francesca Perez Evans, and I am the Community Engagement Librarian with the Government and Heritage Library. Today, we're partnering with the State Archives in North Carolina on this Women's History Month Lunch and Learn series with today's speaker, John Horan. Please let me give you a quick overview of both of our programs. The Government and Heritage Library, or GHL, is a section of the State Library of North Carolina, a division in the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. We focus on North Carolina history and culture, state government information, data and statistics, and family history, as well as the official repository for North Carolina state government publications. The State Archives of North Carolina, our sister agency, is also a part of the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. They collect state and county government records with permanent value. These types of records include wills, estates, governor's papers, and state agency records. The State Archives also has a special collection section that collects audiovisual materials, maps, oral histories, as well as military and private manuscript collections. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over the next three upcoming Lunch and Lunch series that will be held this March. To join us for those, use the links in the chat box that I will put after I start. Next Tuesday on March 16th, we'll present Making Time for Women's History, exploring online collections, resources, and free exhibit tools with Kelly Egan from the State Library. On March 23rd, we will be presenting at 12 p.m. a viewpoint of her own, the Black Mountain College photographs of Helen M. Post will be presented by Sarah Downing. And finally, on March 30th, Heather South from the Western Regional Archives will be presenting about reconstruction aids. Again, I will put those in the link in the chat box in a couple of minutes. Now, what we've all been waiting for all morning, please let me introduce our speaker, John Horan. And before I get started with that, if y'all have any questions, if y'all could please wait until the end of the presentation, we would really appreciate it. Or if you do have questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A, I will be moderating both. So let's get to John. As the new oral historian for the State Archives of North Carolina, John Warren brings the skills and techniques learned over eight years as a practicing oral historian. He received a bachelor's degree in American history at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. He also received a master's degree in history with a museum studies special specialization from Cleveland State University. At CSU, he began understanding the craft of oral history through the Center for Public History and Digital Humanities where he spearheaded several projects and consulted on others. He's also a PhD candidate in the field of public history from Arizona State University. While completing his coursework at ASU, John honed his abilities as an oral historian through his work as a legislative oral historian for the State Archives, State Library, and Public Records of Arizona. In 2019, he created a commemorative, excuse me, <laughs> um, oral history project for the 60th anniversary of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. As an oral and public historian, John use, utilizes best practices, skills gained in the field, and an education steeped in shared authority to conduct, preserve, and disseminate oral histories for the state of North Carolina. Please let me turn over this presentation to John. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Francesca, for that wonderful introduction. Um, now, what a better way to kick off Women's History Month and the day after International Women's Day to boot than by listening to some notable women speak to their experience of North Carolina's history. These women interviewed between April 2019 and February 2020 show that history is alive and it's constantly being molded 
and reshape. As Francesca said, my name is John Horan and I am the new oral historian for the State Archives of North Carolina. I started working here in the middle of December, so I've only been here a couple of months. Um, and being the new oral historian, of course, is interesting. But starting a new oral history program, that adds another layer of excitement. The unit is just over two years old, and my predecessor set up the foundations for a great program. And I'm looking to take it to the next level uh, by working on several projects that document the lived experience of people around the state. I've looked at other programs and projects in the state, and I think we can work on oral histories to complement and expand about, upon what already exists. So here, of course, we're gonna talk about the She Changed the World Oral History Project. But to give you a preview of some of the other oral history work we're creating, we've got two COVID-related projects uh, coming through, one with government records and one with Your Story is North Carolina's Story. Both of these projects will be conducted remotely, which adds a whole nother twist to the proceedings. Um, but for today, we'll look at the traditionally conducted face-to-face -face oral history project, and I'm gonna bring you through the She Changed the World oral history project. First, um, I'd like to point out exactly what we learned about the art of oral history by conducting this project. And I have a few key points to highlight um, that helped to form the beginnings of a great oral history program. Now, once we talk about the nuts and bolts of the project, we'll get into the project itself. I'll share some highlights, analysis, and most importantly, the voices of our narrators. Uh, I wanted to, uh, that last point is particularly important. I wanted to say that, I wanted to limit my own voice in this presentation. I'd like to limit the, the women to relate their stories as much as possible with their own voices. <clears throat> now, an education in oral history. What I mean by that is this project taught us a lot about the narrators and their experiences, of course, but it also taught us in what I term a meta understanding. In other words, we learned about how to create oral history in addition to learning from the content of the oral history. So the establishment of this project showed us a great deal about many women who had a hand in shaping North Carolina, but it also showed us a great deal about how to establish an oral history program. Having this tangible project run simultaneously with the initial organization of the oral history unit meant that the theoretical idea of conducting oral histories was realized with a robust and tangible project. Since this project was part of a larger effort to recognize women and the influence of women in the state's history with a specific deadline, She Changed the World could have been called She Created an Oral History Program. By utilizing this type of project as part of a larger showcase, uh, it, it, guidelines and protocols needed to be created and honed rapidly. And I'm happy to say that the, this process occurred with great success. Through the pressure cooker of She Changed the World, the oral history unit established benchmarks, created guidelines uh, for the transcription of, or sorry, for the development of the transcription guidelines, and in the collection of and accessioning of new and different style projects, and for the maintenance, maintenance of a robust internship program. Here I wanted to take the time and underscore the help that the summer interns provided in 2020. Over the summer of 2020, uh, in the midst of a pandemic, with everyone working remotely, we had the assistance of two great interns, Sarah Waugh and Gretchen Boyles. Their main task was processing the interviews, including crucially creating and reviewing transcriptions. But in addition to the administrative work, our interns worked creatively for the project as well. Sarah and Gretchen wrote four blogs about their experience, and with the help of our digital archivist for online programming, Randy McRae, we got three of them published with the last one on the way. Uh, links will be included in the presentation and, and at the end, I can get them to you. Um, in their blog, Sarah and Gretchen discuss several points of emphasis. In her first blog, Sarah highlights the role of education for the women interviewed. It, nearly all of the women speak to their work in creating, shaping, or downright changing the way education is done in the state. And Sarah highlights several of these key stories. In her second post, Sarah analyzes what the women we interviewed said about the judiciary in the state and how women have left their mark on that branch of government. 
Meanwhile, Gretchen reflects on what the women said about facing adversity and gaining the inspiration to advance despite being a so-called odd woman out. In her second post, which will be coming soon, Gretchen addresses what representation meant to the women and in the project. The women she included in her blog highlight the value of being intentional about helping the next generation of women excel in their fields. What Sarah and Gretchen write highlights the value and depth of this project. Currently, you see the stated goals of the project. What our interns show, and indeed what the project represents, is a realization of that goal. We sought to interact with women across a wide range of professions to learn what we could learn. And I'd like to share a few more of those findings with you. We sought to interview women in these seven categories. And I'm happy to say all seven and more are thoroughly represented. As I've said, each of the winner, women interviewed as part of this project is a trailblazer and has pioneered in her field either by doing something that had not been done before, by being the first, or building on what came prior and opening new doors for others. What this project and these oral histories did and continue to do is put a contemporary lens on the larger history of women in the state. The stories show that the change that women affect, are affecting on the state, it's not in the distant past. These women represent a sort of living history that measures how far we've come and still underscores just how much more we've got to do. Education is a passionate subject that just about all of the women we talk to mention. Banu Valadares discusses working on teaching kids using alternative methods. She shows that art can be instructive and an effective style for reaching children. Shasta Hamilton also highlights alternative methods of, reaching, of teaching through her collaborative dance studio. She emphasizes working with each other in dance which is a stark contrast to the competitive model traditionally used in that field. Meanwhile, Dr. Dr. Lindsay Zano brings the discussion to science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM. As a working paleontologist and professor, Zano relates stories about teaching the value of data. And I add parenthetically, it rings true, especially during this pandemic. There's um, a, a passion in our culture for paleontology, and so it often feels more like an art than a science um, or a cultural icon than scientific data. And the truth is that, you know, we're human beings living on a dynamic planet, and we have challenges, and that planet is alive, and it's changing, and we have questions about how to survive, and what's the best approach, what's sustainability, what... You know, out of all the things we could do to preserve our world and make it safe for us to live on, you know, what are the things that we should do? And, you know, we can't protect every organism that's alive on this planet right now in the face of extinction. Who should we protect? And we need all of this data to make informed questions, even about human health. You know, um, diseases evolve. We know that. We know most people understand antibiotic resistance and how organisms are adapting and changing. Paleontology is the longest running natural experiment on Earth. It's over 4 billion years of life responding to global change. So it's our real data on to be able to answer these questions of, of how evolution works and how life has got to be the way it is, how life responds to climate changes, both slow changes and um, quick changes in the face of mass extinction. And if we can just discover this data, understand what it means, and use it in a predictive framework, then we've got real-world data for the way things have been to help us understand the way things are going to be and how we can affect change that's positive for us. Activism is another thread we pick, on, pick up on from talking and listening to our collection of terrific women. There is activism in politics and women's rights, and in indigenous affairs and in sports. Take a listen to Dr. Janie Brown and how she calls herself a Title IX complainer. I, I, I'm a Title IX complainer still to this day. 
Uh, and I know the athletic people well, and once in a while I think they don't want to see me coming because they know I'm going to say something. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. I have, I've just expressed this out there. You enter the men's games, and they check your purse. You enter the women's games, don't check your purse. So the first woman's game this year, I went in, and there was a man standing there doing the tickets, and I said, well, I guess it just doesn't matter to you all if I get shot at a women's game. You just don't want me to get shot at a men's game. And he said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> and I said, why don't you check purses for the women's games? And he looked at me and he said, it should be checked. I also found out that the women have men students. They have to qualify uh, academically, but they come and practice with the women's team. When they send into Title IX to report the number of participants they have to the NCAA, they count those men students as a woman student because they practice with the women's teams. And it, it's, you know, the big things, they have to offer scholarships and everything. And, and that's, that's, that's the good thing that they do offer that. But it's just the little things that just irritate a person like me because I see that. And sometimes I feel like, I can complain. They can't fire me. You know, they still want my money. Uh, and many coaches would not feel comfortable complaining about some of those things. Another key story of activism comes from Heather McMillan Nakai and her efforts at getting the Lumbee tribe recognized. Mary Fitzwin discusses her efforts to bring multiculturalism to homeschooling. Children of color weren't seeing any people of color as speakers at the annual conference for North Carolinians for Home Education. I was a speaker. That doesn't really count. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I'm uh, also part of, of NCHE. And, you know, my kids get to hear me speak at home whether they want to or not. But we weren't just um, targeting uh, people of color as speakers, but we were very intentional to bring them in so that when we held conferences or workshops, uh, and they were always for families, the families would see that, yes, there are other homeschool families of, of color because, it, again, if you only pay attention to what you see going on in Winston-Salem, which is where they have their conference, you have a very different idea of what homeschooling looks like. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, homeschool families of many, many ethnicities. And so that was our, the intention for Heart for Homeschools. So Lisa Jones has combined activism with culture and worked to create an African-American walking tour in Washington, North Carolina. Meanwhile, Elder Myra Segovia shares the recognition she's received. I don't know that anything is going to take us uh, to the high that we had um, in being recognized by President Obama and actually getting to meet him and be recognized at the White House for the work that we're doing both as a Centro Hispano hub and also for the Mi Casa program. You know, um, this was 2015 where we were recognized for uh, as a bright spot under the White House Initiative for the Excellence in Education of Hispanics. So it was the bright spots in education and also the commitment to action uh, recognitions that we had. We also heard stories about gender discrimination and efforts to persevere in the face of that discrimination. Efforts that built upon what came before it and what they hope came, will come soon. Chief Justice Sherry Beasley discusses the recency of many of these historic breakthroughs. I'm only the fourth woman. This court is celebrating its 200th anniversary this year. Um, only the fourth woman to serve as Chief Justice of this court. And so the history is modern history. Um, uh, and only the second African-American woman and the eighth African-American. It's all recent history. Those are, of all those folks, only one is deceased. That's recent history. 
Another interesting discussion came through reflections on the differences between men and women. For example, we had two women, Catherine Overby and Dolores Todd, remark on what they should and should not wear in a given situation. Or whatever the, the distinction is in the husband and wife, there's just extra on women. And so, you know, as a prosecutor, as a judge, coming to court every day, coming to the workplace every day, and then getting the call from daycare that your child needs stitches or that you've got, you know, you got this activity this afternoon or whatever, and so you're pulled in different directions, whereas men don't have that constantly. I don't see that. Um, I just had a conversation this morning with a female assistant DA about wearing skirt suits in front of jurors because that's what they want to see women in. And it's still there. And it, how unfortunate it is, you know, as we're both wearing pants today, <laughs> you know, but how, you know, getting called little lady by another elected official who happens to be a man, you know, and, and dealing with that. So I think gender does, it still play, I mean, it's, we're not, we're not equal yet. I remember a couple of my early uh, days in the ACC, um, we would always have a coaches meeting uh, before we built our new office. We didn't have room. So we'd have a coaches meeting the night before the championship started. So the first swim meet was at NC State. And um, so we had our meeting at NC State. But the meeting was also on Valentine's Day. So I had a red suit on. I didn't think anything of it. So as the coaches are leaving, the Carolina coach comes up to me and says, D, next year the championships is at Carolina. Are you going to wear blue? I was like, what? <laughs> you mean to tell me all you have to look at is what color I have on? And you know what? I found out they all did that. Still, despite the trials, our women are notable women. And don't just take my word for it. Instead, listen again to Chief Justice Beasley. Because being a woman is different from being a man. Our experiences are different in so many areas. And I'm sure in all the folks that you're talking to, these are, not, these are women who have blazed trails. Um, these are women who have, um, by their determination, have changed the course of their lives and the lives of people around them and changed the course of history. And they dared to do it. This project spoke with over 20 women and collected more than 32 hours. So you can imagine there are quite a number of conclusions we can draw. It's just a taste of the interview, 18 interviews that are online. Now, there will be a link for that too. Uh, the remaining few are being transcribed and will be online soon. But I've only scratched the surface of what the women said about how they shaped, changed, and molded North Carolina with what I've shared. I invite you to explore the project yourselves and see what interesting and groundbreaking stories you might find. And I wanna say that the job isn't done. As we've shown, women continue to make remarkable changes in the state and its recent history. And we're still interested in those stories. We're still interviewing and taking nominations for this project. In fact, I have two more interviews coming in. One with the Gaston County Museum, they're doing it and then they'll be uh, giving it to us near the end of the month. And another one with an individual that due to the pandemic had to have her interview postponed. So it's still ongoing and I'm still interested in all of these stories. Uh, thank you. And uh, now I'll open up to questions. Thanks, John. We do have one question um, that has come up. And so I just realized when I sent that last message about the oral history materials that are available through the North Carolina Digital Collections, I sent you the wrong link. So I'm putting in the correct link now. So one question we received was, you've gotten a range of diverse professional experiences already. What further collecting directions will you pursue for this project? Well, that's a good question. So um, th this project is, 
by collecting a range and hitting on all of those categories, um, adding more people in those categories just broadens the experience. So I, I'm, I'm hesitant to pick something and say, we're gonna only collect in activism or in government or in sports or whatever the case may be, because I don't wanna limit myself that way. I want, I want to be able to continue collecting with this large range of, of people and categories and, and, and tick on these data points. Just like Dr. Zano said, we got to hit on data points. And that's really uh, a key uh, part of this project. If y'all have any questions, please use the chat box. There's an icon at the bottom of the screen. We're more than happy to answer any questions you've have or you thought of while listening to a lot of these oral histories or clips of these oral histories. We would love to hear um, any questions you have. So uh, John, uh, my question is listening to a lot of these women, the remarks they were making are experiences they had I'm not surprised, but do you think that some of them were like a little bit more surprising than others or like, I just, you know, I'm a woman. So like, you know, these are things I deal with on a daily basis. And, and I, you did bring this up. You are talking about women for this particular She Changed the World project. And that brings a different perspective for you. So what are your thoughts about that? Like, cause we really are talking about like their own voices and what they're dealing with at the time. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's always gonna be something different for me um, because of my different experience. I don't have to deal with a lot of the issues that the women raise. So that's why I wanted to be, I wanted it to be as much their voices as possible. Um, I don't, you know, uh, you want to hear what, what they have to say. And so I wanted to emphasize that point. As for the surprising factor, um, a lot of things kind of threw me off and, and put me for surprises. But what was most interesting was at the end of each interview, near the end of each interview, I should say, um, each woman was asked about what's a notable woman and what's the definition of success. And it's fascinating to hear um, each woman's perspective on that. And, you know, it's not surprising that they'd all be different, but it is surprising that they can be grouped. And, and they certainly can be grouped. And, and some, you know, uh, put it as pr in perspective with, with a comparison to men's experiences and, and, and perceptions. And others didn't do it that way. Um, you know, some took a specific approach about this is what's a notable woman and he, you know, very defined. And others said all women are notable, full stop. So it's that kind of threw me. Yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty big surprise, I have to say. Thank you. We have a couple more questions that came through chat. Are all the interviewees born in North Carolina? If not, how did you determine the connection to your state? I guess this would be a part of your like, collection policy for oral histories that you're taking in. Yeah, so on the, um, so to start, they're not all born in North Carolina. Um, they, born in North Carolina was one of the choices, you know, one of the options, if you were born in North Carolina, then you were eligible, but just because you weren't, didn't mean you weren't, you were ineligible, it just had to do with, um, you know, what, if there was some sort of influence in, in some kind of way on North Carolina and people had come and go into, in, into the state, you know, uh, all the time. So some of the women, for example, a lot of the women actually who weren't born in North Carolina were born in Alabama. That's an interesting little point, two or three of the, of the one. So most of them were born in North Carolina, but the ones who weren't, two or three, Alabama found, their, found themselves here and, you know, uh, shared their stories. And they're interesting because they, either found some political success or rose in educational uh, uh, you know, ranks and, and, and had different success that way. So they showed up on our radar. 
um, on our website where the, the mission statement is in that, in that, um, on that page is a list of criteria that's more in depth than what I'm bringing to you now um, about the selection process uh, that we utilize. I will try and find that link for the mission statement and I'll put that in the chat. Another question is, is there an end date to the project or will it continue indefinitely? Well, so as a project that's part of another project, it's, which is, as I said at the beginning, it, it's the end date has come and gone, right? The She Changed the World larger project had a run through date of November, 2020. And um, obviously we are beyond that. Um, as it comes to, as it pertains to collecting these stories, I don't know that there's ever an oral history that is concluded um, to take sort of a philosophical answer to such an, to, the, to, to that very um, practical question. Uh, it's a theoretical answer, but I don't, I don't think that, you know, what am I going to say? No, you're not notable. We're not interested in your story. I can't do that. So I'm going to always be collecting. It might, it might not be um, under this umbrella anymore because you know we're we're collecting for this other project and your story is notable and you happen to be a woman so therefore you're part of this project and not that project that could happen but that's more of an organic thing uh, than a hard deadline you know that that's just the way that sort of oral histories kind of work out is that you have a, a big push with a bunch of people that you want to reach and then as you go along people tell you hey what about this person and what that, about that person. And just because the product is finished doesn't mean we're not interested in collecting those stories. So for these stories or stories that you'll be collecting in the future, will you be collecting additional materials such as photographs to accompany the interviews so that you have that different, I guess, <laughs> different um, material to go along with it? Yeah, you know, ideally speaking, um, we would collect you know, as much as we could, right? That's the point. So you collect somebody's story and you collect something that represents their likeness and you collect something they've written and you collect, you know, so all of these avenues will be explored each interview. Some, sometimes it might not be feasible. Sometimes it, it doesn't make sense um, because, you know, they gave us our, their oral history which is their version of the of the story at that moment, but they've already decided to give their papers to a different archive or previously, I'm saying, or or whatever the case may be. Um, so to, to put it in 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 sort of nebulous terms again, um, yes and no. I, I, I'm always interested in collecting people's likenesses because I think it brings a richness when you listen to an oral history to have a photograph at least to see the person that's talking, you know. Um, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't make sense, especially if somebody be, if somebody's collecting and, and donating their a project to the archives, not something that we're doing. Maybe they didn't do that. It's harder to go back and reach these people. It, it, it's it, that's the kind of those are the kind of questions you have to answer uh, on a case by case basis. But the overall general perspective is, yeah, I, I, yes. So to go forward with that, it might be something you might like write in the finding aid or like the cataloging, like related material you can find at other institutions if they have already gave those papers or collections to someone else. And, and it's what you're right. It's like the one-on-one -on -one situation. And I actually do have a question about that. And um, we do have a question in the chat that kind of goes along with it. Um, if anyone has any recommendations for a narrator or someone that you think would be great um, to interview for this project, please recommend. We'll give you our contact information right after the slide, or you can put it in the chat to us individually or for all of us to see. But, you know, I feel when you're doing an oral history, you're basically recording someone's feelings on whatever the topic may be or like what they went through. So how do you help someone who are, who's coming to these recordings to feel comfortable or like how do you build that trust 
so that they know that their voice is being heard and not necessarily taken away. Like it's it's a very mm -hmm. tricky. Yeah. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, um, somebody who's going to be interviewed, how do we assure them that this story uh, still belongs to them? I think that is that what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. and like, what do you do to like make that com like? How do you comfort them? Because mm -hmm. they're basically yeah. giving a piece of you during these interviews and that's sacred. Like it's, Absolutely. I kind of think of the analogy of it's, this is the information I'm putting in my journal because I want to be, be able to like look at it later or just be able to talk it out. So yeah, yeah. how do you build that trust? So that's, um, it's, it, it's, that's sort of fundamental to the, to what I do and the field of oral history. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's, done well it's very clear that it is a collaborative project it's not sort of somebody coming in and taking something away and so i try to make that very clear up front i have pre-interview phone calls that I, I usually call people several times before we sit down and do an interview to talk to them you know ask, invite them to be part of the project sort of tell them why we think it'd be interesting that they are part of the project and then once we get past that, we schedule it. I have another pre-interview where I talk, talk to them and, and confirm that we're doing the interview and sort of make them feel at ease with the collection, with the, the, the mission behind the collection, with their story, because it's, it's it, I try to make it very clear that oral history is not me taking a part of your story indefinitely. It's me taking a part of the story at that moment. So memories change, people change, individuals, they change all the time. So, and telling a story in different contexts changes the story. So if they go on and then say something else later on that changes the story, it doesn't invalidate what we have and what we're not gonna say, hey, look, you said this, you gotta stick to it. We're not subpoenaing these people. This isn't a courtroom. We're talking to them. We're trying to get their story. And that's the other thing is that it's a conversation between me and the, and the, and, or the interviewer and the interviewee, uh, in this case, you know, sort of me, but, and, and the conversation is sort of what you described about working in a diary, working something out, right? So you say something and I ask a follow-up question to sort of get more detail, to get more, more information. And the more information, the more detail somebody puts out there, right? The, the clearer the picture is gonna be. So I try to get to that as, as much as possible. And you know that's where you start looking at things like the clock. You also gotta be aware that people after about an hour and a half, and certainly after three hours, they're, they're, not, they're not sharp anymore. So you, I would rather reschedule and have a follow-up interview than try to cram it all in in like a six hour marathon. Because you know, people start, that people zone out even when they're the ones talking i'll tell you so that's that's the kind of thing you got you got to balance all these things um but that's a, a a long response to that question it's what you're just talking about a follow-up um conversation that kind of like caught me off guard i'm like but oh my goodness it makes complete sense like you know or when we're doing presentations and webinar, we don't want it to go past an hour because we know how people are going to interact, especially since we're not in like a physical location. But it never occurred to me that you can have a follow-up interview and it's okay to have one, but you also need to like be open about that with your interviewees because they may not know that or like, or they may not feel comfortable to do that. So it's like, what it's again, you know, reading or like talking with the people that you're working with and like having that conversational interview because it's, we want to make everyone feel comfortable and you want to build that trust so they know that you're representing whatever they're talking about fairly. That's all. We just want to feel trusted and guided or not guided, but just trusted and know that whatever we say is in a 
non, um, what am I trying to say? Like a, well, it's not formal. We're not trying to push not, someone for a certain right. language or like a certain, um, it's not contrived. Right. It should be natural. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I call it, it's not, it's certain, I, I employ, uh, a non-formal approach. It's not, it's not casual, but it's conversational. And, and that's sort of the way I ap approach things. And, you know, um, uh, th there's been an evolution in, the, in, in oral history, to be sure, um, from casual to formal. And now we're back into casual uh, or conversational, as I said. And, and, you know, there's trends, just like there's trends in everything, you know, and that's the other thing that when you do um, talk to somebody, and then if you talk to them again, you know, not as part of the same project, but as let's say in five years, we have a different project and I wanna talk to one of these individuals I just mentioned today. Those five years are gonna be filled with experiences and, and, and events and some good, some bad, some great, some horrible, you know, and all of that is gonna change the perspective. So I could ask the same exact question in the, in the two instances and get a totally different answer because something new has come up that's changed perspective. I mean, how many, you know, every one of us has changed our vision on something as a result of something that happened to us or because of us or for us or whatever preposition you use. And so therefore, you know, you gotta capture these things and, and you know, just like you take a picture of somebody they don't look the same in five years. They won't say the same thing in five years either. That's a great analogy. And I'm gonna go on to another question and kind of what you're talking about, just thinking like from my personal experience and like when I think of oral histories, I think of like the historical part of it, but even like interviews that I've seen like this past weekend, like I know this is a horrible example, please excuse me, but like with Oprah and um, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, like that was a conversation, but that's technically like an oral history of like what they went through. And it was a conversation, it wasn't forced. And I feel like everyone felt comfort with what was going on at that time and like, or what they were saying. And so I feel like that, that was their experience and we need to, it's, we need to feel comfort or like we need them to feel comfort in order to say whatever they feel is needed to say at the time based on a question. So yeah, I really I mean, appreciate yeah, that. Like Oprah's, first of all, we should all be so lucky to have interviews in that setting. I mean, come on, that was just beautiful. But, um, Oprah's a, a terrific interviewer, you know, and that's what this is. It's interviewing. Now she's interviewing with a particular vision, particular lens. I'm interviewing with a with a with a eye towards a historical narrative. You know, that's that's a major difference, sure. But we're both interviewing, um, and that's something that I had to in, in that in the previous job I did with with the legislative uh, oral history in, in Arizona. I had to make sure to let those legislators know that I am not interviewing them as a reporter who, that's trying to get a scoop or trying to get them to catch them out, you know, say, let's get them to say something and then publish it and say, hey, look at, at how off this person is or whatever. No, I, I'm, I'm interested in their perceptions of the, of the past and, 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 and creating a narrative and an, and an analysis um, for, for the archives and then for, for researchers, researchers later to use. So that's, you know, I'm interviewing, but it's a different slant. And that different slant is, um, it's important. Totally. But I just like, I feel like that conversation, like it just, that's how I can relate to it. Um, Cause I'm not an oral historian, but I think if we find ways to how to relate it and how people feel comfortable and how they're going to be able to speak their truth is kind of like, we need to figure that out. And like, that's probably what a lot of those pre-interviews are that you're doing. So we do have another question and this kind of relates to that. Are you aware of any interest by students or researchers to make use of the content content that you, um, I'm assuming that created with this, this oral history program? Is that all tracked? Uh, so downloads are tracked. 
uh, page views are tracked. Um, I'm not sure if it can go beyond that. That I, I don't, unfortunately, don't have the answer to that. I can find out, but I don't have the answer to that at hand. Um, I do know that a um, one of our transcripts from 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 the um, uh, from that from the let's see. Excuse me, one second. Yeah, from the Lisa Jones interview, the one I mentioned, she she created a walking tour um, for uh, African American history in Washington, uh, Carolina, North Carolina, and um, that transcript is actually now a citation on the Wikipedia article for. Um, and I didn't do it, so don't you know? Don't say I'm pumping up my own stats. But I, it's up there on on the Wikipedia article for uh, uh, the Underground Railroad, because the Underground Railroad, everybody knows, is is this is this you know northern story that goes to ca to Canada. But actually, it's not just that. There's a po portion that started in North Carolina, or not started, but I, I should say a a point of embarkation was in North Carolina and they would go to um, Caribbean islands that, that weren't participating in, the, in, the, in, this, in, the, in, the, uh, in slavery. And so somebody referenced that and used the Jones interview as a citation for that reference on Wikipedia. So that's a tangible thing I can point to. As for the other statistics, I'm not, like I said, I can find out, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. So I just put in the chat, are there any last questions before we sign off? Um, I just, I'm super grateful to be here and moderating this presentation. I learned a whole lot and I can't wait to take the information that you given to me and figure out how we can do like more programming in the future. Like it's just, sometimes it's really, as a historian or like librarian, I read a lot, but to hear someone's voice talking about their experiences, it's like, it brings it to a whole nother level. And it helps me be okay or be appreciative of like how I'm feeling or what they're feeling. It's like, we're all going through our own thing. We all have our own stories. And it's so nice to hear that people are willing to tell their stories because that's what's important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's just one of the most personal ways of, of hearing and understanding somebody's history uh, and a, you know, a, a region's history or, you know, even part of a global history. So it's, it's, it's that, that's the, that's the value of it. It's personal and it's immediate and it's recent. So it's living. All right, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Y'all get out 10 minutes early. Are y'all excited <laughs> to have 10, 10 extra minutes? I thank you so much, John. This is amazing. I'm putting in John's info, um, contact information and then I will put in mine as well. If y'all have any questions, if y'all wanna contact us, please do. Um, thank you again so much for attending today's presentation. We really appreciate it. It was such a great turnout and I loved all of the questions and material that everyone. Yeah, the questions were great. And, and thank you, uh, Francesca, for putting this thing on and moderating and keeping track of the questions and, and all that. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you at our other um, lunch and learn series with the Women's History Month. And I will put those again in the chat, but otherwise y'all have a fantastic day and we hope to see you next week. Bye. Bye.